Can you hear me now? Oh, perfect. Sorry about that. Well, thank you so much for joining me this evening and taking some time out of your Friday night to talk about some of the things that we do here at MGH Fertility Center. Um, I'm the IVF Laboratory Director, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, my expertise. So today we're really going to be focusing on the semen analysis, that portion of the infertility workup. So again, I'm going to try to keep an eye on some of the questions as I go through, and maybe I can answer them as we go. Otherwise, if I don't get to them I'll, right away during the talk, I'll try to scroll through them at the end and try to give them my best chance at answering them at the end. So. So I think it's really important to always remember that infertility affects men and women equally. So sometimes I think it really feels like it, the burden falls on the woman and it's a female problem, but it really, it's not. Um, it's kind of alarming. Um, one in seven, there's estimates of one in seven U.S. couples are infertile and even one in 10 U.S. men have some sort of infertility. So almost about 50% of infertility is male factor related not solely male factor, sometimes it's a combination of both male and female factor, but about half the time it's actually a portion of it is the male factor. So briefly, these are some of the things that we're looking for. And just to point out that semen analysis itself is actually relatively simply simple to complete. Um, and as we know, it's not very invasive. So these are the parameters that we're gonna be looking at, and I'm gonna go back to this later, so don't try to memorize everything. What I wanna really point out to you is that we are using the most current um, WHO reference ranges, and that's still back from 2010. So that was a, a modification almost a, about a decade ago, but still it's holding true. So we're looking at the volume of the semen itself, the pH of the, semen, sperm concentration, motility, really how the sperm's actually moving in a progressive manner, if it's viable, and some of the morphology things. And again, I'm going to be talking about that, breaking that down into more detail as I go. So why is it so important to do a diagnosis of male factor? And I think this is really kind of drives it home that any delay in a diagnosis of male factor infertility really can extend the infertility treatment process for the couple and really result in unnecessary interventions for the female partner. So we really want to do some of these easier tests and um, right away, such as testing the male. So that's why they bring the male's men in quite early on in the process to see if there's a really clear indication of what's going on with the couple. So here are some basics um, for the semen analysis. Pretty simple. We always are requesting that we have a photo identification. It could be a driver's license, a passport, some sort of photo identification to make sure you are who you are, make sure that our labels are matching everything. Because every once in a while, when you register yourself into the hospital system, maybe your date of birth is wrong. Maybe the month and the date are off or Maybe the spelling of your name is incorrect, and we want to make sure that it always matches up. We also want to match that up with you in person so that you can feel confident that we are only processing your sample. So we can have a really clean handoff that way. We ask gentlemen to abstain from having any ejaculation, um, sex or masturbation, two to three days prior to an analysis. And we ask that because um, if you wait too long, if there's too big of a period in between your ejaculations, you can have a lot of dead sperm in your sample and it can really throw off how we analyze it, um, analyze the results. Also, if it's too frequent, if it's kind of the same day, um, sometimes your numbers will be a little bit lower than what would be natural, what may naturally occur. So we, roughly try to shoot for two to three days of abstinence before you provide a sample for an analysis. Um, we ask that you collect in an approved sterile cup or a condom. So this is really important too. So if you're going to do a semen analysis and there's options to do it at home, we will send you a collection cup or you could pick up a collection cup from our center. The reason we are pretty strict about this is that we are 
extremely rigorous about testing all of our supplies. And we wanna make sure that there's no residue or anything on the plastics that you're using that may actually be harmful for the sperm because we don't want you to be collecting it on a cup and it's actually the plastics itself that are making your sperm motility look lower than it really is. So we wanna we, um, kind of make sure everything is done in a proper manner so that we are confident in the results that we get. Um, we also ask that you do not use any lubricants for collection, any kind of lotions or anything, because most products are harmful for sperm. They can throw off our analysis. So no lubricants for this. The other thing we ask, and this is important too, especially when we talk about doing a home collection and bringing in the sample, we really would like it within an hour, maybe a little bit more than an hour is okay as well after the collection. But if you're starting to exceed an hour and a half or more, um, the sample can really start to decline, specifically the motility. So we really like to try to get it within an hour of it being collected so that we can have very accurate results. And what we want you to do is maintain it at body temperature. So we don't need it on ice, for sure. We also don't need it, um, we've had people try to bring it in with hand warmers that you use for skiing. Not a good idea either. We want it just at room temperature and it does just fine. And the best way to do that is after the, the collection has been made, just stick the cup in your, in your pocket. It could be your coat pocket or whatever, your jeans pocket. That's the best way to maintain it at body temperature. So I'm gonna give you a tour of the laboratory because you know I think it's always probably pretty awkward um, just imagining what the whole process is gonna be when you're being asked to go on site to a clinic and produce a specimen on site. Um, I just kinda of wanted to give you a really brief tour to show you it's not as bad as it sounds. It's not like the movie Ted. It's not as awkward as it has to be. So what happens is you would check in at the front desk and they will ask for your ID. And keep in mind, you're gonna be asked for your ID numerous times. Take that as a great thing, that you're constantly being asked and identified. So here you're gonna go down a private corridor, and within the private corridor, here's a door. And this door goes specifically to the collection room. And what I wanna point out is it's a double door. So there's a double door privacy here, one from the hallway, and then another one straight to the collection room. Here's another level. So it is a keypad collection room access only. So you don't have to worry about anybody opening that door and wa walking in on you. So that's there too for your own privacy. And if you look right above the lock, we have a sign showing that it's in use, just extra assurance that no one's walking in. Here's the actual collection room itself. Um, it's a private space. What you can't see in the very back is there's even a noise machine. The noise machine, I think, is more for your comfort so that there's some background noise going on, but you're so isolated that there's no noise that really comes through that door. Um, if you look really far back on the back wall, there's this turnstile. That's actually where you would place the specimen after you've done, you're done collecting it and you spin it around, right? So you would put the specimen in the cup, turn this, this wheel right here, and it goes right back to the laboratory. And that's your whole specimen handoff, pretty simple. And here, here's the other wall. This is on the other side of the door and this actually goes into the laboratory. And so it spins around and then there's a light right above and we know when it's done and we can begin to process the specimen. So, and you're free to go. As soon as you're done producing the specimen, you're free to leave. Here's another option, and this is right now what we are giving to a lot of our patients, especially during this um, pandemic, is we are mailing out some kits for people. So this is what the kit contains. The kit contains a specimen cup, a biohazard bag, a brown paper bag for privacy, and also this blue sheet. And this has the instructions for how to go, how to go about collecting it, has our, a map for where it would be dropped off, and that's kind of a curbside drop off where our valet parking is. And then the really basic questions for you to ask, um, answer. This is where you're gonna write your name, you're gonna put your birth date, you're gonna say whether or not you were able to collect the entire specimen. Every once in a while, the full specimen doesn't go into the cup and you just indicate that. 
The reason being, if the numbers are really far off, it may be because you didn't get all of it into the cup. And then we can put a note on it. So we don't want to say that you have a big fertility issue when actually it might have been just the collection issue. Um, and also we ask for the number of days of abstinence. So this is your information. And when you hand it over to us, we're also writing in that we checked your ID and we sign off for it. So we always have a paper trail and a record and a proper, appropriate handoff for when we receive your specimen. Within the laboratory, specimens are processed in a, a workstation hood. It's under sterile conditions. And I think it's really important to know that here only one specimen is processed at a time. So you'll never have two patients using the same hood or two things being processed simultaneously. It's a strict policy, one patient at a time. I might have a question um, if saliva impacts the sample, and it does. Um, we don't want saliva on the sample when we receive it, um, and it can be, it can kill sperm. So any, anything like that can be really toxic. And also sometimes we are processing the specimen for let's say an IUI or to be used for IVF purposes. And you can have different bacteria or anything in the mouth or the saliva that could actually contaminate the culture system. So we ask that there's no saliva um, for the final collection. Once we receive the specimen, um, it comes out agglutinated, it, it comes out um, thick. And so what we want to do is we give it some time to liquefy. So usually that takes about 20 to 30 minutes. And in some samples that are really viscous, it can take up to an hour to really liquefy the sample. And the reason we do that is because we want to get a very accurate count. Um, if it's very thick at the time, um, it's very difficult to quantify the sperm counts. So we give it some time to liquefy. During this time, we are making other notes on the semen analysis. We are looking at the color. We're looking at the overall viscosity of it. Um, if the sample itself, it should be kind of a, like a whitish gray type color. If it is a little bit yellowish, it means there's a little bit, of, there's likely some urine in it. If it is brown or some um, red in it, it's likely that there could be some blood cells inside. Um, we're also making other notes. So you, you might see this on your semen analysis that you can have gelatinous clumps. And these are little chunks inside the semen. Um, and the reason we make those notes doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the sample itself. It just means that that can confuse the counting. It can really, sometimes it can throw off the numbers a little bit. Um, it's possible that we could underestimate or overestimate the concentration of the sperm because of the presence of these clumps. So we just make a note into the semen analysis report to let your physician know that some of these note, um, measures might be a little bit skewed because of other findings within the sample. So again, I'm going to go back to the original values that we are using to say whether the samples are normal or abnormal. So when we talk about the ejaculation, um, the average ejaculation is about 3.7 mils. Um, however, we consider anything that's greater than 1.5 or 1.5 mils um, to be normal. So like a 1 mil volume is more like a teaspoon, or 1.5 mils, a little bit over a teaspoon. So a small volume is pretty normal. So what we know is about low volume is it's it can be associated with absence or decrease, um, decrease of the seminal vesicle components. It could be mean there might be some kind of obstruction of the ejaculatory duct, ducts. It also might mean that there's a retrograde ejaculation. And what that means is sometimes there's an orgasm, but you don't have a full ejection, ejaculation come out. Sometimes that goes back into the bladder. And so if we have really low volume the doctor might order a retrograde ejaculation analysis. And what that means is they would have you do a collection again. They'd come on site, you would do a collection, but after you collect, you would urinate in a cup. And then we would check both, if you have anything that comes out into the cup for an ejaculation, we would check that. But then we would also spin down the urine to see if any of that ejaculate actually went back inside of your bladder. And then we can quantify that and get an idea of what you're working with in terms of sperm. 
Here's an image of our CASA system, and CASA stands for Computer Assisted Semen Analysis. And this is an automated system for, that uh, assists us in counting sperm. And not only does it help us count the number of sperm in your sample, it also allow, helps us kind of analyze and quantify the motility of your sample. So we use this quite often um, on our samples. However, sometimes if the counts are so low, we have to do a manual count where we literally are just putting it under the microscope and we put it on top of a grid and we count the cells individually. Here's an example of what the sperm looks like in some of these manual slides that you would use. You would put a drop on the slide or inside one of these um, chambers and we would count the sperm. So the WHO says um, normal sperm concentration is defined as if somebody has more than 15 million sperm per mil in the sample, that's considered normal. Um, and that's based on the average sperm concentration is actually much higher. It's around 73 million per mil. Um, so if it's a really low concentration of sperm, and sometimes so low that we're not able to find any when we're just looking at these grids, so you see the grids below, some, like on the right, we don't see any sperm. If that happens, we want to make sure, we want to check the entire sample. We don't want to just check a portion of the sample. So when I said we put some of that semen onto a slide, we take about six microliters. So it's just a tiny amount of the entire sample that we use to um, analyze the whole sample. So if we don't see any sperm on the sample, we take the entire ejaculate and we spin it down in a centrifuge. Um, we do that so we can see if there's any sperm present at all in the sample because sometimes the sperm numbers are so low that we have to spin it down in order to find any. Um, and if there are no sperm, then that's another consultation with a urologist to talk about possible reasons there's no sperm in the sample. Okay. So when we look at sperm motility, a lot of times when we think about semen analysis, we're really talking about the sperm concentration, the number of sperm total, and also the sperm motility. Sperm motility is critical, as you can imagine, um, because you can have all the sperm in the world, but if they're not swimming, it doesn't really matter. So we consider normal sperm, if you have 40% or more that are modal, the average man has around 61% modal sperm. Um, and when we talk about motility, we're talking about all forms of motility. This can be, this might mean sperm flying across the, the slide going forward in a straight prog um, a progressive manner. It also includes the sperm that are swimming in circles or it, involve, it includes sperm that are just barely twitching. That's sperm motility in general. So what we are looking for is um, just overall sperm motility because it also speaks to whether the sperm are viable or alive. If we want to break it down further, we want to look at the forward progression score of the sperm. And I find this very important. So if you get a score of zero, and this is really clear in the semen analysis, it's all spelled out. The zero means absolutely no motility. It's not even twitching. Um, a one is it's a little modal, but it's not swimming in a forward progression. Two, it's, it's slow. Um, it's going a little bit forward, but it's slow. Three is good sperm. It, it, it looks really great. It's going straight in a forward progression. This is probably the most common sperm motility that we see with gentlemen. And four is when they're just flying off the stage. So that's really how we're breaking it down. Like I said before, sometimes there's zero motility in a sample. And it's obviously very concerning. But just because they're not moving, that doesn't mean they're not alive. So what we do with the samples, if we have no sperm that are actually modal in the sample, we do a stain. It's a live dead stain, and it tells us whether or not the sperm are alive. So you can see here on the right, this sperm is, all, is, is completely white and no dye penetrated its membranes, so it didn't stain at all. That means its membranes were intact and it's, it's strong and it's viable sperm. It's just not swimming. The one on the bottom is stained, and that's because uh, it was the cell membranes were very permeable. 
the dyes were able to get right in and it's completely dead. And this is important because we can have an ejaculate where all the sperm are non-modal, but most of them are viable. And those sperm can be used just fine when we do other procedures like IVF and ICSI. So it's really important for us to distinguish whether they're live or dead. However, if all the sperm are non-modal, um, how do we know which one is alive? We can't inject sperm that ha has been stained. So there are other tests that we can do in the laboratory. So when we're actually gonna pick up the sperm and use it for ICSI or where we put it directly into an egg, we can use a viability assay called a hypoosmotic swell test. So what we're doing is we're putting in a hypoosmotic media and as soon as you put in a, a live cell sperm, even though it's not modal, that tail will curl up right away. And if that tail curls up, we know it's a viable sperm. If the tail doesn't curl up, that means the water is passing right through the membranes, no problem. And that means that sperm is dead. So in this case, and it's rare that we ever have to use this, but in this case, we know this is the best sperm right here, the one with the curved tail, and that's the sperm that we would inject into an egg. I'll talk a little bit about sperm morphology. And when we talk about sperm morphology, we're just talking about how the sperm looks. Um, so we consider sperm morphology normal if 4% of the sperm look normal. And it sounds crazy, right? That if 96% of the sperm look abnormal, it's still considered a normal specimen because humans really actually have a lot of very abnormal sperm and it might not be as meaningful as, that, as we may think. Um, we really, if it's 4% or above, the sperm seem to do just fine. And I know it gets a lot of people pretty nervous when they see that number that they only have 4% or 5% normal sperm, but that is perfectly normal. So what we have seen too between ejaculates that morphology parameters really don't change. So one, me one morphology measure within a year should be sufficient. It should be enough. Um, and the, really there's little evidence out there that there's other things that you can do to change your morphology score. So your morphology score is what it is. And here's what we're looking at. We are looking at some, several, um, a few aspects of the sperm. We are looking at 200 sperm for each of, your, each of your semen analysis, and we're quantifying it that way. We are looking at the head region. We wanna make sure, sure it's the appropriate shape. We wanna make sure this acrosome is the appropriate size, this white piece inside the sperm. We're looking at the neck to make sure it's not bent or kinked or um, um, abnormal in size. We're also looking at the tail to make sure that it's the appropriate length and it's not bent and it's not kinked. So we're looking at numerous things to try to say what is a perfect sperm or not. Um, and that's why we call it strict criteria because it's extremely strict in what we are able to call as normal. So after we do the semen analysis, um, we send a report to your physician. And the report is going to say, it's gonna go through all those parameters, the volume, the concentration, the motility, the forward progression, and the morphology, it's gonna go through all of those um, items. And at the end, we're gonna put a little note whether we think this specimen is sufficient for IVF, where we do conventional insemination. And basically that says everything is pretty normal. Or we would say something in the semen analysis has been flagged as abnormal, maybe not grossly abnormal, but in that case, we may recommend ICSI or other process for utilizing the sperm. So when we utilize sperm for clinical purposes, like for interuterine insemination, the IUI, or if you progress onto IVF or ICSI, this is how we would process the sperm. We take the semen itself, and you can see in the bottom left-hand side, we have this bottom clear piece inside this tube, that bottom clear media, that's actually a, a sperm separation media right there. And what we do is we layer the semen, that semen right here in this kind of yellowish color that's layered on top of it. And all the sperm is inside of that. And so what we do is we spin it in a, center, in a centrifuge and it's spinning for about 20 minutes. And as you can see in this picture, this first picture right here, you can see that kind of line separation between the clear media and the semen itself. That's that meniscus. 
and only the, the highly modal sperm can swim and break through that meniscus, that layer right there, and swim to the bottom of this tube during the centrifugation. So after the centrifugation, you can see this layer gradient. See all this white at the very bottom of this tube? That, that's all highly modal sperm. So that's what we're doing. We're separating all the highly modal sperm out of the semen. We're separating it from all the non-modal sperm, some of the really slow twitching sperm, some of the round cells that we'll find in, in an ejaculate, or some of the debris that we sometimes find in ejaculate. What we're doing is we're spinning it down and making it clear um, and only getting the, the modal sperm. So really what it's doing is kind of doing what happens during intercourse where there's an ejaculation and the sperm, only the highly modal sperm, are able to penetrate and swim through the cervical canal. Those are the ones that make it out. So we're kind of doing that in reverse in the laboratory. We're trying to get all that highly modal sperm to process its way through and then um, isolate itself at the very bottom of this tube. Then what we do is we wash it a couple more times into clear media to really make sure we get a very clean pelleted sample at the very end. So you can see we were able to get all of this white gunk out and we're left with this clean white pellet of highly modal sperm. Then the next thing we do is we layer media on top of it and then we allow the sperm to swim out. So then the, swim, the sperm begin to swim out of this little pellet up higher and higher into this tube. And those are the sperm that we end up using for processes like IVF or ICSI. Those are the ones that went through all the rigor of making it out of the semen, um, being processed a few times in the laboratory centrifuge, and then swimming out. Um, that allows us to identify the forward progressing modal healthy sperm from the sample. So some other things I just want to point out to you, um, you guys, you don't get to see this part um, after you hand off the specimen, but I want you to know that there is, there's a very rigorous identification process that goes on behind the scenes. It starts with you. It starts with your identification and you checking your cup. You are in charge of your cup. You're looking at it. You're confirming, yes, that is my name. That's my birth date. Those are both my identifiers. And then also on the cup is your partner's name, um, label, and identification. Both of those stickers are on it, and you're confirming, and you're signing off on it. Say, yes, this is, in fact, um, the sample, and this is how I want it to be utilized. As soon as it gets into the laboratory, we do another sign off. We have two embryologists verifying the cup um, and every tube. And all of those tubes have the same um, two labels on and we identify every one of them before we process it. Again, we only process one specimen at a time to ensure that kind of safety. Again, even when we're doing a centrifugation, like I was talking about, um, we use one at a time. So only one patient can be in this centrifuge at a time. And here's an example of that. Same exact patient divided into two. Okay, sorry about that. A couple other things I want to point out. That's how we use, that's how we are identifying specimens all the way through the, the process um, and how we process it for IVF and IUIs. There's other things that we can do too. Sometimes we need to freeze sperm down because one, maybe the partner can't be present the day they, they need to be on site for an IUI or they can't be present the day they're here for IVF or ICSI, so we need to freeze sperm for those purposes. Sometimes they're going to travel to a place um, where um, I think just travel restrictions. Um, it could also be somebody freezing because of other medical procedures that are happening. Maybe it could be for pre-cancer treatments. Sometimes we'll have a men freeze for that purpose. Also, sometimes we have people with really low or really poor sperm counts. And we need them to freeze in advance so that we have some sort of backup um, to make sure that we have a sample to work with on the day of an egg retrieval. Um, we also have gentlemen that have maybe a little bit of anxiety about collection on the day of the retrieval, or they've had some performance issues in the past and they just wanna make sure that they have a sample on site after their partner goes through the whole um, IVF and stimulation process. So sometimes they will freeze in advance for that purpose. 
some beauty about sperm freezing is once it's frozen on ice, and it's really relatively simple for us to freeze, once it's frozen, um, it's frozen indefinitely. So it today, it's as good as it's going to be 100 years from now. So it does quite well. Um, and we really don't need to freeze a lot um, in order to have a sufficient amount for the future. So um, it does quite well. And really, the process of freezing sperm hasn't changed that much since the 1950s. And you know, there are specimens that were frozen way back there, then, 70 years ago. And there's a laboratory that still saws a vial every day on the anniversary of the first sperm freeze and celebrates because the motility never changes. And so they've been doing that for about 70 years now. It's pretty cool stuff. So here you go. So one ejaculate really can be divided up into numerous vials. Um, we typically, and it depends on the volume, but typically we do around six or so. If it's for cancer purposes and we need to be even more conservative, we might divide it up even further, or we might ask them to do repeat collections so we have adequate um, samples going forward. And then after we freeze it, we store it in our liquid nitrogen tanks and we have all the appropriate testing to make sure your sample is safe and all the other samples in the tanks are completely safe. And if there was any kind of infectious disease testing that um, wouldn't make it qualify for one of our ta tanks, we have agreements with other long-term storage facilities where the um, sample can be stored and frozen for long-term offsite. Um, and just to let you know, all of our tanks where specimens are frozen are monitored 24-7 to make sure if there's any fluctuation in these temperatures that we are notified immediately. So there's a lot of rigor involved um, in maintaining these tanks. Um, I have a question, a great question. Do you analyze the sperm before freezing? Absolutely. We perform a full semen analysis before we do the before we actually freeze the sample. So we do that for a few reasons. Sometimes, one, it informs us of how the sperm is when it was frozen so that we can um, predict how it's going to thaw so we know how to utilize it. So let's say it was a really poor sample and we had a hard time finding any sperm. We may make a note on it saying, hey, we may need to thaw more than one vial on the day of the IUI or on the day of the IVF case. So we want to have the information ahead of time. Um, and, so, and, and so we can inform the patient as well that, hey, the sample was not adequate. We're going to need you to freeze maybe a couple more times so we can feel comfortable in the amount of sperm that you have frozen. Or we can say, hey, that one sample was fine. You should be good, you know, for several rounds of IVF. So we want to have that information in front of us. Um, so we had a question about how often do you thaw and you refreeze, and is it used for only one cycle? So I think that's a really good question. Um, so what we try to do is freeze enough vials that we are, we're thawing one vial per cycle. That would be ideal. But that doesn't always work. Sometimes we'll have a sample, and it might be somebody's last sample, right? Um, a patient who is undergoing cancer um, treatment, or it could be somebody that is using um, a frozen vial of donor sperm, and it's that last vial of donor sperm available. And so we can do a process that's called shaving it. So we can only thaw a portion of that sample at a time and keep it refrozen. Um, and we've, we've used a single vial of specimen um, several times over in those cases. So yeah, it is definitely possible to do that. Um, and when the question is, do we thaw and refreeze? In those cases where we are scraping it off, we're not actually fully thawing the specimen. We are just taking it slightly out of liquid nitrogen. It's still completely frozen. And it's almost like one of those ice slushies. You're scraping off the top. So it's really like scraping it off, like these ice crystals. And that's the portion we're thawing. So we're, we're trying not to like, do any damage because every time you freeze and thaw, you can you can create some kind of cryo damage. So we want to minimize that chance. So we want to do we want to keep it frozen um, pretty much at all times. So great question. Oh sorry, that was yeah. Let me check. Yeah, that's what I have for slides. I'm happy to answer questions at this time.
And if you guys have any questions that you don't feel comfortable with asking here, please contact our, our um, center and I'd be happy to answer them individually for you. Um, here's a question. Do things affect viability of sperm, i.e. caffeine or hot tubs? Yeah, so one, I think we all know, but really listen to this, don't smoke, don't vape, don't do any of that kind of drugs and things like that. That's really terrible for sperm. There are certain supplements you want to um, have approval from your doctor before you use certain subs, um, supplements. Um, it's never a big surprise if you see a really big beefy muscle guy come in here and then they have really low sperm counts. You can almost predict that sometimes. So you want to be careful if there's, you know, using any sort of steroids. Um, hot tubs, I think you probably do. You don't want to live in a hot tub for sure. Um, I think we had a case once where, and I think some hot tub is totally fine, right? But you don't want to do anything excessive in terms of temperature. We had a case once where the sample was completely non-modal, completely non-modal. And, you know, we monitored that and it was a couple months later, the gentleman came back in and fantastic motility. And we could figure it out. It's like, what was going wrong with that day of the, the, him collecting that sample? And when we probed him further, he admitted that he, I think it was a bachelor party and he had been drinking and passed out in a hot tub. So it was likely that, you know, caused some damage at that time. So you do want to kind of take care of things as well. Um, so question, is there any clinical utility in looking at DNA fragmentation during an infertility workup? Um, that's a great question, actually. Um, so what we know is things like cigarette smoking definitely increase DNA fragmentation, um, and that's very problematic. And high DNA fragmentation can be related to other negative outcomes for IVF cycle. So you do want to do whatever you can do to try to minimize how you could have um, high DNA fragmentation. So some of those things where there's studies showing that more frequent ejaculations can decrease your DNA fragmentation, so that's a positive thing. Um, of course, no smoking, maybe temperature control would be good. Um, but when we are processing our specimens for IVF, for ICSI, we are using a double um, processing um, method, and that's called when we use a density gradient and we follow it by a swim up. And we actually have done studies on this where we can almost eliminate DNA fragmentation. So we've had guys with higher DNA, DNA fragmentation, but when we processed it in this double manner, we've reduced it down to around three or 4% of sperm that, are, that come out of that pellet as actually having DNA fragmentation. So it does quite well at separating the fragmented versus the non-fragmented sperm. So um, how does low morphology and motility impact IVF with ICSI success rates? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so when you have a low morphology, so we haven't seen any real decrease when we're using it with ICSI. So, and even in the literature, it shows that there's only a couple um, morphology um, phenotypes that are really associated with abnormal like cleavage divisions or other problems with IVF. And that's where they have these big, large, round, bulbous head headed sperm, and that's quite rare for us to see. Um, pretty much most of the other sperm morphology abnormalities can be overcome um, using an ICSI procedure. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about drinking effects on uh, male fertility? Um, I, I would say this, I'm not an expert in this area. So that is something you're gonna to wanna to talk to your um, IVF doctor or urologist about. Um, I think anything in excess is probably not good, but I don't want to limit anybody's drinking during this pandemic. So, Is there somewhere to look up what is considered a normal sample for post vasectomy reversal? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, and actually, I wish I had the reference here. I was just looking at something showing you know, what you can expect per month over a course of 18 months. I just, I don't have it in front of me um, for how long it takes to get back to a more of a normal sample. So that is something I'd have to get back to you on. 
Anybody have any more questions? Um, yeah, I know this is running a little bit over. Um, I really appreciate all the questions. I think they're really fantastic. I wish I had a quick answer for the normal sperm post vasectomy reversal, but I don't at this time. Um, but if, again, if you have any more questions, definitely feel free to reach out to us here at um, MGH Fertility Practice, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions um, over the phone or in person. So one more question, then I take one more. If semen analysis looks normal, is it safe to say that it is likely female issue? No, um, I wouldn't say that. There's other things that we can't see. Um, we can't always see everything that's going on with the sperm. So there are sperm that looks perfectly normal and there could be some kind of genetic um, issue going on as well. So we can never completely rule out male factor just based on a semen analysis. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciated um, all the questions and you guys really taking some time on your Friday evening to um, learn a little bit more about the male factor in fertility. So thank you so much. And I wish you guys the very best with your fertility journeys.